This year marks the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party in America. On December 16, 1773, 60 men dressed as Mohawks, incited by an angry crowd of several thousand Bostonians, dumped 342 chests of tea valued at over 3 million pounds in today's money into Boston Harbor. This protest by the colonists was one of a series against taxation imposed directly by the Crown, instead of agreed on by their own assemblies. No taxation without representation. It caught popular imagination and marked a turning point. From here on, events moved slowly, but almost inevitably, towards open rebellion in the colonies and an armed struggle for independence from Britain. Was it truly inevitable? What if this man, Charles Watson Wentworth, the second Marquess of Rockingham, who was twice Prime Minister during the turbulent reign of George III in 1766 and 1782, had remained in power for longer? Would the Boston Tea Party ever happen? Tea, my lord. Uh, thank you. Who was this little-known British Prime Minister? Charles Watson Wentworth was born in 1730 at Wentworth Woodhouse, one of the five surviving children of Thomas, Marquess of Rockingham, and his wife, Lady Mary. His parents instilled in him from childhood his crucial role in caring for their tenants and dependents. One of the earliest stories told of him is that, age 11, he came on a pensioned-off soldier and his family fainting from hunger, who had been turned away by a servant at the big house. Young Charles was appalled. He gave them the food from his own pocket and escorted them back to the house to see his father, the Marquis. He begged his father to give the man a job and a cottage on the estate, and even offered to give them his own quarterly allowance. His father was happy to do so. He was proud of his son. The young Charles keenly felt his duty to provide for those who could not provide for themselves. He also was passionately loyal to his king and country. As a 15-year-old, he ran away to join the Duke of Cumberland's army at Carlisle, to fight Bonnie Prince Charlie's Jacobite army who were trying to depose King George II. To join them, he rode for two days and nights over wild moors with only his groom for company. The Duke of Cumberland called him the Little Warrior and packed him off back to his father at Wentworth. But the two became lifelong friends. George II was well pleased with him and called him a hero of the times. His loyalty to the Hanoverian throne and his courage was unquestioned. In 1750, whilst on his grand tour of the continent, he received a last letter from his dying father, who called on him to use his inheritance for the benefit of the king, your country all your tenants and dependents. He came home immediately to take on that duty. In 1751, aged just 21, he inherited his father's title of Marquess of Rockingham and all his father's estates in Yorkshire, Northamptonshire and Ireland, together with houses at Malton, Hyam Ferrers, Newmarket and London, as well as in Wicklow, Ireland. And of course, the majestic Wentworth Woodhouse. He had a personal income of £40,000 a year, almost £11 million today. In short, he was young, rich and powerful, with a politically savvy wife, and by 1760 wielded considerable influence in court and parliament. He and his Whig friends believed in a constitutional monarch, who ruled through parliament, and whose excesses could be checked by that parliament. He was immediately at loggerheads with the new king. George III was determined to claw back what he saw as a wicked cornering of power by the old king's ministers. 
one of his first acts was to oust the old dominant Whig lords and replace them with his own favourites, the King's Friends. In 1762, Rockingham resigned from his post of Lord of the Bedchamber in protest and was immediately stripped of his officers as Lord Lieutenant of the West Riding of Yorkshire, Lord Lieutenant of York and Vice Admiral of the North. A host of dismissals and resignations followed amongst minor office holders loyal to Rockingham. The next three years were characterised by weak administrations and political infighting and jealousies as the King played off one faction against another. This ultimately prevented the rebuilding of Britain after the Seven Years' War. This worldwide war had cost Britain over £130 million and 160,000 lives, over half its army. Heavy taxation, unemployment, particularly in Yorkshire, Lancashire and London in the weaving and spinning industries which had profited from the war, led to riots and attacks by mobs on unpopular members of the government. Finally, a series of disastrous harvests sent the price of wheat through the roof. In April 1765, adding to other disasters, the king was confined to his room for a month with a bout of the illness that would plague him for the rest of his life. By May 1765, he had recovered enough to attempt to replace his latest unsatisfactory administration. George charged his uncle, the Duke of Cumberland, with forming a new administration, an almost impossible task, with the various political leaders declining to work with each other or the king. George had sworn never to let those ministers of the late reign who had attempted to enslave me come into my service while I hold the sceptre, but was reluctantly brought to agree to an approach to Rockingham. And Rockingham, with all the reluctance of a man who, from private reasons and inclination, preferred a private life, where he might be as useful outside the government as in, was persuaded by the distress of his old friend the Duke to bow his head and swear himself to the service of his king and country. Rockingham had spent the last three years consolidating his position as leader of a loose coalition of Whigs. He had made improvements on his estate by conducting experiments to increase the yield of wheat and enjoyed riding, breeding and racing his beloved horses. Not to mention dealing with the shocking and deeply embarrassing personal and political fallout from his youngest sister Lady Henrietta's scandalous marriage to her young and handsome Irish footman. In July 1765, he was thrust centre stage and the problem of the American colonies was about to become his worst headache. The king and his previous ministers, facing a disastrous domestic economic downturn, had sought ways to make the colonies make a financial contribution. The sugar tax of 1763 was followed by the Stamp Act in March 1765, a tax on every official piece of paper used in the colonies, to be paid only in English coin. Had it been successfully collected, it would have drained them of every piece of English money in America. When news of the hostile reaction of the colonies arrived shortly after Rockingham took office in July 65, the King and Parliament were not unduly concerned. Rockingham, however, may have been one of the few who had received early intelligence of the tempest brewing. In August 1765, a chance meeting at Newmarket with a distant relative from the colonies, John Wentworth, the future royal governor of New Hampshire, gave him an opportunity to discover the unvarnished truth about the opinions of the colonists. The Stamp Act will not only hurt the colonies, but England as well. British merchants would need more compensation than they needed during the war. 
The Stamp Act will exacerbate the perennial shortage of currency in the colonies, and the stamp tax collectors should be prepared to accept boards, plank and joist, Indian corn, and Spanish potatoes in payment. Rockingham sought out information. Letters flooded in from all parts of Britain and the Empire, especially from the increasingly disaffected American colonists and those British merchants who traded with them. He was ably assisted by his wife, Lady Mary, and his brilliant secretary, Edmund Burke, whose encyclopedic knowledge and political instincts helped fill the gaps left by Rockingham's inexperience and highly principled approach. By November, anti-stamp tax riots had erupted across the continent of North America. Thomas Boone, ex-governor of New Jersey, wrote... I have some hopes that a governor, more acceptable to the people, may confide in the militia and take the proper actions to free us from a state of anarchy and the dominion of a mob who not only terrify the magistrates but may put the match to the powder of discontent that threatens to blow up all the provinces. Americans seem to be determined to fight it out. Depend on it. They will suffer no more to execute any law to raise internal taxes not imposed by their own assemblies. We are Englishmen, and we must be free. With riots, petitions and assemblies meeting in the colonies to protest the act, it was clear to Rockingham and his supporters that the only way to defuse the situation was to repeal the act. At a difficult meeting with the king, who had been in favour of using threats or force to subdue his rebellious subjects, a stern Rockingham brought the king finally to consent to repeal the Act. The Act would be accompanied by the declaratory bill that insisted on the monarch's right in principle to impose such measures on the colonies in future. The king was angry and humiliated. In his eyes, Rockingham was a marked man and his administration on borrowed time. Even on the day of the passage of the bill through the Commons, the King's friends secretly whispered that the King did not favour the bill and would be well pleased if it was defeated. Despite this, with Burke acting as whip, the bill was passed by 275 votes to 167. Ironically, when the King went to the House of Lords to give the royal assent to the bill, there were such vast crowds of people cheering and clapping the King that it was several hours before His Majesty reached the House. The whole city of London rejoiced, with bonfires lit in celebration, while on the Thames the ships on the river were lit with illuminations. In America, the news was greeted with relief by merchant Captain Samuel Carey in Boston, May 21st, 1766. My lord, a ship from London arrived here a few days past with the joyful news that the Stamp Act was repealed. Duty and every other feeling obliges me early to make my most grateful acknowledgments to your lordship for restoring freedom to this land. Your appearing for us has incited the highest esteem and veneration in every individual, and your name will be handed down to posterity as their great deliverer. I am your lordship's most obliged and most devoted servant, Samuel Carey. The Rockingham Ministry limped on for another four months, while Rockingham used his time to repair the breaches in the constitution made by his predecessors. In July 1766, the king sent for Mr Pitt to form an administration. Rockingham was to spend the next 16 years in opposition, fighting a losing battle as his successors reversed his policies, imposed direct taxes on the colonies and began a costly and unsuccessful war. In 1782, Rockingham, aged 52 and in poor health, was recalled to office to bring to a close the disastrous war with the colonies. The king refused to see him for three days and drew up his list of ministers without speaking to his new prime minister. In four brief months, Rockingham passed a long list of constitutional reforms and protections, 
the most critical was the agreement to formally recognise America as an independent country. He did not live long enough to sign it. Exhausted by anxiety and long hours, a long-term stomach disorder that he had suffered with since childhood finally claimed him. He died unexpectedly at his house in Wimbledon in July 1782. He had asked for a quiet, simple interment in the family vault in York Minster. It proved impossible. The procession carrying his body was joined by swelling numbers of his tenants. And 200 citizens of York rode out on horseback to meet him and to escort his body back into the city. Shots were shut and crowds lined the streets. His wife, his family, his friends were desolate. His country had lost a champion. It is said that Yorkshire wept for one of its own. Such a man was Charles Watson Wentworth, the second Marquess of Rockingham, and the Prime Minister at two key points in the history of Great Britain and America. And, to return to the question, if Rockingham had remained in power longer, would the Boston Tea Party, that iconic act that lit the touch paper to the flame of revolution, have happened at all? And the answer is no. Rockingham believed in peace and trade and was willing to explore conciliation. Those who followed him into office reversed the policies and passed the increasingly punitive acts that led to the Boston Tea Party. The independence of America from Britain was inevitable. The manner of it was not. Rockingham was unable to earn the favor of a king who was steadfast in his efforts to impose his will on his empire. Without the king's favor, he could not hold his coalition together, and an alternative, more peaceful route to independence was lost. More tea, my dear? Uh, no. No, I think not. I think we've had a surfeit of tea, have we not? <laughs> 